It actually came from just across the state line in Stokes County, but you have the real thing in here. Most everything in here is something that would have been available at the right general store. Now, the first three fire engines that the town ever had, including 1917 right here. She's the very first. You uh, see, of course, she's been well used. She's had a good life here. She actually- Hey, how we doing today? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, we are here uh, having a good time going around the town of Mount Airy, also known as Mayberry, and now it is time for a little bit of culture. We're going to the uh, Regional History Museum behind us. It used to be a wonderful, big old giant place where you could get nuts and screws and plants and furniture and all kind of stuff. Uh, but now it is a great museum. It's, I'm going to say it's Smithsonian quality. I mean, it's a good museum. Uh, we're going to talk about two people here, friends of mine, Mr. Mark Brown. Hello. Uh, he is the uh, initiator, inventor, and, and head ghoul of the <laughs> ghost stories here in town. That's true. Uh, and he'll, he'll scare people on trolleys, on the ground. It doesn't matter. He just scares people, beside his wife. And uh, then we have our good friend, Mr. Tom Perry, an author of note. He's written so many books about Mount Airy uh, that they said you got to stop and start writing about Civil War stuff. So You're he does a little bit of all of that. And he's a town historian as well. So you couldn't have two better helpers to come in here and show us around and show you guys around this great museum. Come on. You guys want to go over and check it out? Are y'all with us? Come on. So, welcome everybody to the gift shop of the museum. The building was built somewhere around 1905, 1908. It was a hardware store. This was the way you would have come in through this front door here in the corner of Main and Oak, downtown Mount Airy. And we keep this as the entrance, of course, the uh, desk and all of the other tchotchkes you might buy if you were at the museum. Uh, a lot of it local, a lot of local authors, local crafters, that sort of thing. Worth a look. But right now we're going to go back and do the uh, general store section, which I think is what everybody's interested in right now. So follow me through the archway. So right over here is our general store. Of course, we're walking through history. There's the cabin era. What? What's that here? noise? Oh, well, that's outdoors. I know you're a city dweller and you don't notice, but that there is crickets and nighttime noises. Ah. You see, if you're going to have a cabin and it's nighttime in the cabin, well, then you've got to bring about the crickets and the night noises. We don't have the critters running around in it like you would have back in the day, but you can get the idea. Now, over here is our general store. It's uh, actually part of a real general store. We uh, harvested a general store that was going out of business and actually took all of the furniture and the accoutrements from it and put them in here so somebody could see what an actual general store looks like. Now, this is the H.F. Wright General Store. It actually came from just across the state line in Stokes County, but you have the real thing in here. Most everything in here is something that would have been available at the Wright General Store. Now, of course, your viewers probably know that back in the day, you would not have just walked in and started picking up the merchandise and looking at it. The shopkeeper would have picked it up for you. If you're looking for a can of peas, well, he's going to get the can of peas and hold it up for you so you could see it. Only after you buy it do you get to handle the merchandise, of course. My favorite thing in here is something called a stump buster. Are you familiar with the stump buster? Oh, let me show you the stump buster. Hang on. <laughs> Come on into the right store. This is a stump buster. This is probably the coolest thing in the entire store. If you were blowing stumps up, you take this off and you fill it with black powder and you put a fuse in it and you wedge this down in the top of the stump. And as they say, light fuse and get away. And this thing, which is about as heavy as an artillery shell, goes off and drives itself down into the thing and busts your stump. And what fun you could have, by golly. Some of the smarter farmers actually backed it up with another piece of firewood and were able to shatter their own firewood with this thing. A lot of people tied a rag to it because when it exploded and went off, it might shoot across your yard and into your face. And we want to be able to find this very quickly, the stump buster. And by golly, 
It's just as heavy as it sounds. You didn't buy this, you just borrowed it from the general store, as long as you bought the black powder, of course. You weren't going to be able to break it, so they assumed you'd bring it back in one piece. This is the coolest thing in here, I think. This is a new exhibit about the uh, Civil War in the area. Uh, one of the things in this is Jeb Stewart, who uh, is something I'm kind of an expert on, but we're... Uh, we're pleased with this. It's got a lot, a uh, lot of uh, men from Surrey County served in the war. Jeb Stewart was a uh, major general in the Civil War. Grew up right across the line over here in Patrick County, and uh, this exhibit just uh, has some artifacts from the war. Uh, and exhibit about slavery, results of the war, and Jeb Stewart. So tell us a little bit about him. What did he do? Jeb Stewart was Robert E. Lee's cavalry commander in the Civil War in the Army of Northern Virginia. He commanded as much as 10,000 men during the war. He fought at places like Gettysburg and Chancellorsville. He was born right here. He came to Mount Airy, though, to uh, go to church, pick up the mail, shop, all that stuff, because it's only five or six miles from where he grew up, literally on the state line. So he went to West Point. Uh, he was in the U.S. Army for seven years fighting John Brown and the Indians and ended up a major general. He got killed in 1864 by one of George Custer's men at a place called Yellow Tower in just north of Richmond. Now, did the railroad go under town like that? The railroad came down up here on Riverside Drive. Yeah, it cut right through the middle of the place. It cut right through the middle of the town. And this is the main line. We had the standard gauge railroad, which is what this is. Let's go down there and turn around and come back. And then we had the narrow gauge railroad, which went up to Virginia. So they hit two railroads, they pulled up beside each other. So this is the railroad exhibit here in the Manor Museum. Uh, one of the things Manor used to have was a resort hotel right here, the White Sulphur Springs. It ran by what we call the Manor and Eastern Railroad, which was a narrow gauge that ran up into Virginia. It hauled lumber out of Kibler Valley up in Patrick County, Virginia. Uh, and it uh, brought people to the hotel. The uh, granite quarry is over here. The railroad ran by the granite quarry. It's the largest open-faced quarry in the world is here in Mount Airy. And uh, Mount Airy Granite is famous all over the world. But this exhibit has both the dinky, which is the air gauge, and the main line, which ran all the way down to Winston-Salem and beyond. And we have an exhibit of what Mount Airy looked like in the heyday, in the heyday of the railroad. And uh, if you look right here, this is a museum. Oh, how about that? There it is. What, what year was this building built? Uh, I believe in the early 1900s. I'm not sure off the top of my head. Uh, the railroad, the Dinky, ran from about 1899 to about 1924, and the main line still comes to Mount Airy. The main line railroad still runs here. Now, what's this big building behind this building? Is this still up here? Uh, that is one of the old textile factories, I believe. Okay. Uh, Mount Airy was big in textiles and furniture and the granite quarry. That was the uh, three main things we had here. And Mount Airy flourished, especially in the late 1800s into the, oh, until the 1970s, really, when textiles kind of lost its boom. But uh, Mount Airy uh, was a very vibrant place, a lot of old money, a lot of great Victorian architecture here in this town, if you look back to that time period. But uh, this is, like I said, a rendition of what Main Street looked like. This over here is a new project. Uh, our intern, James, is building a remote controlled uh, train layout so that people can interact with it from this rail here. They'll never touch the trains, but they can push a button and have the train stop at the station or push a button and have the train deliver a boxcar full of lumber. Uh, kind of an interactive thing. One of our patrons donated this because their children had outgrown it, and so we're trying to keep it true to its original form. We've made some modifications, and more are being made. And it's also a good way to learn electronic control of things. So James is learning about Arduino programming and things like that. We're trying to work stuff in here to update the story as much as we can. We'll have a sunrise and a sunset in this building eventually. And people may push a button and hear the train conductor if they want. Um, Ordinarily, we have sounds in this room, which we've turned off for today, so you can hear us talking about it. But this is fairly an interactive thing, and what this museum is trying to do is get more interactive. People just love to push those big old white buttons, like the one behind you. Of course, it's turned off. <laughs> <laughs> so what's this? Uh, what's, what's going on right here? Uh, this is a this is a, a, a recreation of a small 
town's telegraph office slash railroad station. This is where you might purchase a ticket to get on board, and it's an authentic ticket window. And see in there, they've kind of recreated some of what you might see. The station master's typewriter, the telegraph machine. Ordinarily, you can hear things like that in there. We also have tools from the ancient days when they did railroad work with actual railroad wrenches and railroad hammers and that sort of thing. And there's a nice display over there on the quarry too. I don't know if you saw that yet or not. Hey, I think we should get into one sliding down the pole. You were step. It's so welcome to the bottom floor of the museum. Uh, a lot of the buildings in Mount Airy don't actually have basements. We're sitting on top of a granite rock here in this town. This is the lowest level of the museum, which you would probably call a basement. And we are lucky enough in this area to have the first three fire engines that the town ever had, including 1917 right here. She's the very first. You uh, see, of course, she's been well used. She's had a good life here. She actually went away to Charlotte for several years after she was sold and came back home eventually. A big campaign was raised to bring her back and restore her to working order. She rode in one parade, she broke down, and then she wound up here, and we're glad to have her. Not many people can have the first 100-year-old fire truck in their town. We've got 1917. She had a birthday party several years ago and fire trucks came from all over the area to help her celebrate. Over here behind us, this is the second fire truck. This is 1926. Uh, everything we have is American La France, or at least that's what we have when Mount Airy started. Now you start to see a difference in the engines. There's much more fire apparatus in the middle. The pumps have gotten bigger. The tanks have gotten bigger. Now we're using actual rubber tires and wheels like a real truck would have. Back here, we're using wooden wheels on the earlier model. And this one, of course, served Mount Airy very well and eventually wound up here also. Over here, this is 1946, she's my favorite. And the reason is, is because she's a very special kind of fire engine. This is a fire engine for a much bigger city than Mount Airy would be. Notice how there's no roof. That is so if you're in Charlotte or Asheville or Greensboro or some larger city with tall buildings, the firemen can look up and see where the smoke is coming from and know where to drive to. Mount Airy's tallest building is about five stories tall, so we really didn't need one like this but she was for sale and a good bargain. So we've used her and part of my job at the museum is I do the interactive exhibits. So we've turned her into an interactive exhibit. If you're standing here and you push one of these buttons, well, some facet of the fire engine actually works. Or maybe you wanna ring the bell. Or maybe you want the light to come on. Or maybe you want to start her up. at a museum is that had to be the sound of that engine running. Some fireman from somewhere will walk in here one day and push that button and if he doesn't hear a genuine American La France twin setup engine like this running then he's going to call us out on it. So I had to find that recording. It's not this particular engine running because one of the great ironies of life is when you bring a vehicle indoors and permanently put it on display the fire code makes you empty every single bit of the fluids out of the engine so the engines freeze in place and they'll never be able to run again. Sad but true. But hey at least people get to see her now in all her beautiful glory and play with her siren if they want to. So how many cylinders is this? This one is, uh, is a double row of uh, six cylinders. Each one has a dual ignition on one side and a dual ignition on the other. So she's 12. 12 cylinders? Yes. So they, they've got two, two spark plugs for each cylinder. Uh, it had a dual set of ignitions because you don't want this truck to not be able to start. So this is the fire truck that's defending this half of the city and you want it to run when it's time to run. 
So they have a very unique sound about running. And of course they have a very unique distribution system as well. Took me a little while to figure out the wiring on that. The wiring on the beacon right there actually confused several different people because it was negative ground 24 volt. So what year would this been built? What what model is this? This is a 46. 46. 46 La France. And, the, and did they buy it new or used? They, they bought it new. Bought it new. Mount Erie has always had this, uh, I won't say dread, but has always had a healthy respect for fire. It goes back to 1892 when our entire Main Street burned to the ground on New Year's Eve. It was mostly wood then. And since then, we've been very jumpy about fire. Even a hundred years plus later, we're still very jumpy about fire. We have modern fire engines now that look like they fight fires at Charlotte Douglas Airport. Why a town with five story tall buildings needs a hook and ladder that big? It's because of the insurance ratings for one thing and because we wanna be sure nothing burns this time. That Main Street has a lot of 100 plus year old buildings up there and if they get started, they might go fast. So here on the second floor is our hometown heroes section. We have people that are uh, even some multinationally known. Uh, we've got an Olympic athlete that lives here in town and things like that. Uh, Mount Airy High School, football from the area, Mount Airy Speedway, uh, a lot of local history in terms of things like that. And of course, we go eventually to the Victorian era when they did the sports, like the horse racing and the croquet and things of that nature. In here is uh, one of my former employment places, WPAQ Radio in Mount Airy, AM 740 since 1948, uh, producing bluegrass and old time string band music of the region. Mr. Ralph Epperson, who's shown back here, actually created this radio station in his bedroom when he was eight years old, way back in the hills, before anybody actually knew what a radio station really was, and it grew to where you're going to visit, I believe. This is some of his original equipment and his microphones and that sort of thing. Right here is the RCA record cutter. They used to hand cut records with this thing. And with this, Mr. Epperson preserved a lot of our regional music, making it accessible to us even today. We owe him a huge debt of thanks for that. The WPAQ radio station is still on the air and you can hear it streaming as a matter of fact. So this is the uh, Andy Griffith exhibit here at the museum. This talks more about his personal history than the Andy Griffith show or anything like that. He was born here in the 1920s, graduated high school in 1944. I went off to Chapel Hill where he uh, sat in the band and came up with what it was, was football, among other things. But these are photos. This is it. Reverend Mickey who got him started by teaching him to play the trombone. This is one of the guitars, Andy was a very good musician. He got it from his mother's side of the family. And uh, this is more about the personal life of Andy Griffith, not the TV show. So it's a little bit different than the Andy Griffith Museum, what they do. So uh, the, the area is really known for two or three different styles of music. Of course, we have church music. We have old time string band music. We have the later version of that called bluegrass. And this is a centerpiece of it. This radio station had a lot to do with that. It preserved music like old Piedmont blues and gospel music from the churches and the old time string band music that the first settlers brought over with them from the old country. As a result, there's a lot of people from here that get into music and on a very professional level before they can even drive a car. It's rife with people. We like to say music grows on trees here, and we mean that. Not only are they playing the instruments, there's a lot of families in the area that build the instruments. So we've got luthiers here as well. This museum touches on that also. We also have Donna Fargo, which came from the church tradition. The happiest girl in the whole USA, winner of several Grammy Awards, mostly in the 1970s. Donna is a Mount Airy girl, graduate of Mount Airy High School, homecoming queen, who graduated from here, went to High Point University, and then on to Nashville. She joins us back here every so often, like she was just here this past July. And Donna Fargo started in church. She opened her mouth one day in church and started singing, and once people heard that, her career was set. She also became a very good songwriter. Yeah, Donna had a several hits. The most well known is The Happiest Girl in the Whole USA, Funny Face. When I was a teenager, they were big hits. Superman. Superman. Mm -hmm. And she, uh, she, she's very unusual. She comes back quite often and is very, very happy to be from Mount Airy. Uh, but we're talking about the music. You know, Andy Griffith's mom 
is where he gets his music from, from her side of the family, because mm -hmm. they all played and still do play. Mm -hmm. Still do play. But Donna was a cheerleader at Mount Airy. Uh, my uncle Buddy played basketball when she was a cheerleader. And uh, she, uh, she, I'll tell you something about her. She uh, comes back and she will not leave until everybody who wants to see her gets to see her. I have never seen anybody be a star like that. That's what you're supposed to do as a star. I mean, eight, six, eight hours, she'll sign an and autograph. And not just sign an autograph and next, please. Sign an autograph and ask you how your mama is and spend 10 minutes with just you personally, and then it's time for the yeah, next person. Absolutely. And her fans all accept that and know they're going to wait for three hours to see her. Yeah, so... She's something else. <laughs> so these are, are these some of the real records yeah, or original? Yeah, real stuff. This is real stuff. I actually so, got to hold her Grammy in my hand <laughs> one time. When I very first started at this museum, it was sitting in the middle of the conference table, and I picked it up and looked at it, and the first thing I did was turned it upside down. I always wanted to see what was on the bottom of a Grammy Award. I did it's a, just a stamp. I did a photo book about Man Airy once, and I asked her if she'd give me some pictures for it. She gave me a chapter full of pictures, sent them to me herself. I mean, that's the, how many celebrities do that kind of thing? No. So talk, tell us about the book. What are you talking about? I have a photo book about Man Airy. I have 25 or 30 books, but that's one I did years ago, uh, and it's just photos of Mount Airy. Different chapters, different places, yeah, different people. a whole chapter on Donna, and oh. she gave me all the pictures wow. herself. How about this? So I guess she donated this for the museum? Yes. And those actually are her real stage-worn costumes. Does she still have family live here? Oh, yes. Uh, she came from a family from this area, and there's a lot of them still in the area. Should I say they're a moonshining family? There's an exhibit. I'll do it. <laughs> okay, all right. Let me so do we got a moonshining okay. exhibit here? Um, yes, downstairs. So we'll, go, we'll talk about that when we get downstairs then. Well, and but, there's more on the other side. But, but that is interesting to note. Um, uh, Donna Fargo came from a family of moonshiners. I mean, actually made the stuff and sold the stuff, and some would say maybe they still do. And of course, she escaped that and went to Nashville. That's a movie of the week right there. Yeah. Also, Mount Airy is home to the Easter Brothers, America's first family of bluegrass gospel music. They wrote the book. Uh, they had bluegrass bands before the Easter Brothers, of course, and one of the staples of any real decent bluegrass band is that they would always play a gospel number or two when they did a show. The Easter Brothers turned it into a gospel band, so their early radio performances included them opening the shows by praying for the audience and things like that. Easter Brothers, all of them are dead now, but not before they wrote some several hundred different songs. Some of them you've heard, of course, holding up the ladder that I'm climbing on. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Uh, the Darkest Hour is Just Before the Dawn, which, by the way, was Elvis Presley's favorite gospel song. Not too shabby for three guys from the Mount Airy area. This is our display on them. Russell Easter's guitar, for instance, and some of their Dove Awards up here. And, of course, the Bluegrass Music Awards down there. Uh, down here is Ed's mandolin, for example. And, of course, we've got an interactive exhibit over here. If you want to hear what it sounds like when they first appeared on WPAQ, you push the button and... Well, you get the idea. So they started out as uh, um, young men in their teenage years singing, or they start out in church, or how did they get started? Easter Brothers started out in church. As a matter of fact, the whole band started with a jailhouse conversion by one of them who promised God that if he ever got out of jail, he would do nothing but preach the gospel and sing songs about it the rest of his life. The rest of the brothers followed suit, and the rest is really history. Mount Airy's home to Easter Brothers, and you'll get to see that mural here in a second. Of course, we have our local luthier tradition. There are families from this area that hand build these instruments. People like Wayne Henderson and Gerald Anderson and Arnold Mooningham, and now even Jane Henderson, uh, Wayne's daughter, has taken it up. It's really an interesting thing to think that the wood that comes out of these uh, hills actually can sing, and it can sing pretty well. So we know how to play it, and we know how to build it. 
All right, here are our Ford sedans. Uh, part of what made the area special was, of course, when we were able to stop driving horse and buggy and start driving Model Ts and Model As. The, um, this is an interactive exhibit. You get to try to start the Model T if you can. Will she start? Not that time. How about now? Almost. Let's try it again. Uh, just like the real thing, it might start the first time and it might not. Um, we also have, well, lots of things. These two are very well known. This is part of the history of Mount Airy. These two were brought through that window right over there where Tom is standing. We were not able to bring them up in pieces. We brought them up whole. They flew up here by means of a crane and a guy walked out on the trailer and rolled them in through that window. So somewhere in this great town of ours, there's a man that drove not one, but two Model Ts through a third floor window and survived. So it looks like you might have a picture of that, it sounds like. Somebody, I bet we got us a picture somewhere. Somebody would have had to take a picture of something like that. <laughs> they do. As a matter of fact, there's one down there on my desk. Uh, yes, that's right. Um, I can't remember the guy's name. What was the guy's name? I don't remember his name. Evil. Amish fella. It is Amish. Amish fella. With the beard and everything. Walked out there and rolled him in. No, he rolled it right in. It sat behind it as it came in. But not before they did one of these with the measuring tape to make sure. Last minute. Cleared it by a half an inch. Back here is our medical exhibits, of course. There's a lot of medical history in the area, such as country doctors that traveled around with their little brown bags and delivered many, many babies. Um, the local hospital exhibit, of course. And the space that we're standing in, we've recently started using as a theater. We do live theater up here when the mood strikes us. We can fit 70 people in this little room and have a black box theater. So we've started expanding stuff like with our Levering Orchard play series that comes in uh, January, February, March. Um, over here you see a loom that's docked against the wall till we have a place to put it. And you see things like a baby incubator and you see costumes. Well, you see nurses' outfits from back in the day. Over here, of course, we have education. Uh, Mount Airy had several different things like Rosenwald Schools and the J.J. Jones School, which was a traditionally, historically black high school, elementary and high school area. And of course, we give that over to them, the J.J. Jones School Alumni Association. We're very proud of our diversity right here in this tiny little town in the mountains. So this is Mr. Merritt's office. He built this big building. Uh, at the time, it was at the crossroads of the middle of Mount Airy. This would have been the Walmart of its day. This was a huge three-story tall hardware store. And Mr. Merritt, of course, is the man that made it all happen. Some say he's still with us, although I haven't personally met him that I can say. But this is his office. We've kept it pretty much the way he had it. As you see, his desk and his typewriters and his notes on the walls. He's using an early form of Windows, Windows 1.1, where you just write it on the wall. Um, it's done with nails the way he would have had it, just the same way. This apparently is also one of the first buildings in Mount Airy to have its own telephone. This is one of the first telephones put into somewhere in Mount Airy. It was that important. And yes, it can be said to be haunted. That chair squeaks like a desk chair late at night. Sometimes they find the chains moved aside like somebody had to get that sit down at the desk. People here at the museum have reported running into Mr. Merritt in several places. He's not very angry. He's actually one of the friendlier spirits I've ever seen. Well, I wanna thank you guys for giving us a tour here. Um, very good friends of mine. I'm lucky enough to get to spend time with these guys anytime I want to, but when you all come to town, I want you to come visit the Regional History Museum uh, and then pick up one of Mr. Tom's books. They're everywhere. He's got them in every store that you can personally find. And uh, Mr. Mark Brown, you can see him on the squad car tours. He does them with me as well. And the ghost tours. They oh, do some ghost great tours. ghost tours. And uh, he's one of the leaders, walks around with a lantern, looks like a genuine spook. So uh, <laughs> it'll be a lot of fun to take a ghost tour. Uh, you guys want to share with the hour? What are the hours of this place anyway? Uh, depends on when you come here. Uh, somewhere between 10 o'clock and 5 o'clock every day. And, of course, you can find us online, Mount Airy Museum of Regional History. Not too hard to find. If you want to take a ghost tour, why, that's hauntedmayberry.com. 
sounds good to me. I like it. <laughs> Woo! All right. Well, um, I think we're about done. We want to thank uh, Mr. Tom Perry for coming out and, and giving us a little uh, uh, background. And, uh, of course, we want to thank my good friend Mark Brown. Let's go. We're going to say goodbye. You guys have to stay here, but we're going to say goodbye. Well, goodbye. and Thank you for coming. And we're looking for you anytime you want to show up in Mount Airy, just not at midnight. Yeah, let's, let's do that. All right, guys. I'll see you all later. Let's do it. <laughs>